Hello folks, panpsychism didn't even know him. So I'd like to talk to you about panpsychism and how it is related and not related to Buddhism. First, what's panpsychism? Several people sent me this article from Scientific American called Does Consciousness Pervade the Universe? That was a really weird video effect. I swear to God, I didn't do that. It just did that. Anyway, several people sent me this article, and I'd like to read you the beginning of it. This is by Gareth Cook and was posted to Scientific American on January 14th, 2020, so it's pretty new. One of science's most challenging problems is a question that can be stated easily. Where does consciousness come from? In his new book, Galileo's Error, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness, philosopher Philip Goff considers a radical perspective. What if consciousness is not something special that the brain does, but is instead an inherent quality of all matter? It is a theory known as panpsychism, and Goff guides readers through the history of the idea, answers common objections such as that's just crazy, and explains why he believes panpsychism represents the best path forward. And here he is, Mr. Goff himself, explaining panpsychism. In our standard view of things, consciousness exists only in the brains of highly evolved organisms, and hence consciousness exists only in a tiny part of the universe and only in very recent history. According to panpsychism, in contrast, consciousness pervades the universe and is a fundamental feature of it. This doesn't mean that literally everything is conscious. The basic commitment is that the fundamental constituents of reality, perhaps electrons and quarks, have incredibly simple forms of experience, and the very complex experience of the human or animal brain is somehow derived from the experience of the brain's most basic parts. And in another article from The Atlantic, Why Panpsychism is Probably Wrong, it says... Panpsychism's popularity stems from the fact that it promises to solve two deep problems simultaneously. The first is the famous hard problem of consciousness. How does the brain produce conscious experience? How can neurons firing give rise to experiences of color, sound, taste, pain, and so on? In principle, scientists could map my brain processes in complete detail, but it seems they could never detect my experiences themselves, the way colors look, pain feels, and so on the phenomenal properties of the brain states involved. Somehow, it seems, brain processes acquire a subjective aspect which is invisible to science. How can we possibly explain this? Now, it's kind of interesting if you look at some books in Buddhism, uh, this one I picked out kind of almost at random, Deepest Practice and Deepest Wisdom by Kosho Uchiyama, who was a teacher in the uh, Dogen lineage, the Soto Zen lineage. And on page 34, he quotes Dogen, in an essay Dogen wrote about the Heart Sutra, and the quote is as follows. The twelve sense fields are twelve instances of Prajnaparamita, which is deepest intuitive wisdom. Also, there are eighteen instances of Prajna, eye, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind, form, sound, smell, taste, touch, objects of mind, as well as the consciousnesses of eye, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And Uchiyama Roshi writes this about that. The twelve sense fields are the so-called six sense organs and their six objects. And remember in Buddhism, mind is considered a sense organ, brain is considered a sense organ. The 18 instances refer to those 12 sense fields and the six consciousnesses. The six sense organs are eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. These organs are part of the makeup of our bodies. The six objects are form, color and shapes, sound, smell, taste, touch, and objects of mind. These are the external world. The six sense organs meet with the six objects of the external world and are reflected onto our minds, producing six consciousnesses, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. What is seeing? How can we see? It's truly a mystery. Scientists may explain the function of retinal cells, optic nerves, and so forth, but no matter how much explanation is given, we cannot understand the most crucial point. Eyes are eyes, and things are things, but how does the consciousness of seeing arise? This is really mysterious and beyond our comprehensive thought. The root of this wondrous phenomenon can only be called life. Even if we put all the various parts of the human body together, such as head, chest, or legs, and connect them, we cannot create a human being, unless you're Dr. Frankenstein. 
Only if life functions there is there a living human being. The ground such wondrous life is rooted in is Prajna Paramita, deepest intuitive wisdom. There are a lot of places in Dogen's writings where he says things that seem to imply a worldview that is quite close to panpsychism, and I'd like to read you a couple of those. This is from Eihei Koroku, Dogen's extensive record, uh, also called Dogen's expensive record, because when it came out, this book was $65. Now there's a paperback that's a lot cheaper. I wish I'd gotten that instead. But here is Dogen, and this is an essay which he did not title, but which the authors of this book, uh, Taigen Dan Leighton and Shohaku Okumura, titled Dogen's Four Foundations of Mindfulness. And these are Dharma Hall discourses, so they're much different from what he wrote in Shobogenzo. They're shorter and they're much more poetic. Our Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, said to his disciples, there are four foundations of mindfulness on which people should depend. These four foundations of mindfulness refer to contemplating the body as impure, contemplating sensation as suffering, contemplating mind as impermanent, and contemplating phenomena as non-substantial. I, Ehe, meaning Dogen, also have four foundations of mindfulness. Contemplating the body as a skin bag, contemplating sensation as eating bowls, contemplating mind as fences, walls, tiles, and pebbles, and contemplating phenomena as old man Zhang drinking wine and old man Li getting drunk. And that's like Smith and Jones, Zhang and Li. And it's that line that Dogen often repeats throughout Shobo Genzo and Eihei Koroku, mind as fences, walls, tiles, and pebbles. That's the one I want you to pay attention to. And here's another quote from Dogen that sounds a bit like panpsychism, if you twist your mind that way. This is from Mujo Seppo, the insentient preach the Dharma, or as my teacher Nishijima Roshi called it, the unemotional preach the Dharma. In the words of the ancient, the whole universe in ten directions, that's all directions, is one I. And in the using this word I here, he's referring to experience or the ability to experience. And furthermore, there are thousands of eyes on the tips of the fingers. There are thousands of eyes of right dharma. There are thousands of eyes in the ears. There are thousands of eyes on the tip of the tongue. There are thousands of eyes on the tip of the mind. There are thousands of eyes of the thoroughly realized mind. There are thousands of eyes of the thoroughly realized body. There are thousands of eyes on top of a stick. There are thousands of eyes in the moment before the body. There are thousands of eyes in the moment before the mind. There are thousands of eyes of death in death. There are thousands of eyes of liveliness in liveliness. There are thousands of eyes of the self. There are thousands of eyes of the external world. There are thousands of eyes in the concrete place of eyes. There are thousands of eyes of learning and practice. There are thousands of eyes aligned vertically, and there are thousands of eyes aligned horizontally. So if you took this stuff, and of course there's a lot more along these lines in Dogen's writings and in the writings of a lot of other Zen teachers, you could map out an idea that panpsychism is maybe not exactly the same as Buddhism or the Buddhist idea of how the universe works, but it's definitely along the same lines. So when people hear about Buddhism being a religion that has no God, no concept of the soul, and arguably no concept of the afterlife, although we could probably have endless debates about that one, but I think in a sense you can say it has no concept of the afterlife. People get confused, like how can it be a religion without that? But if you take this kind of quasi-pan-psychist idea that everything is alive, well then you don't really need to have God as a separate entity, you don't really need to have a soul as a separate entity, and you don't really need a concept of the afterlife because everything is alive, so life never actually ends. It just kind of moves to a different place. And that's where you get the idea of rebirth and things like that. Like that. So I, I think these are interestingly compatible ideas between panpsychism and Buddhism. However, I would also argue that Buddhism, in Dogen's form of Buddhism, especially in Zen, is not panpsychism, and I would like to give you some examples of why I think it's not. Here's another thing from Dogen's extensive record, Eihei Koroku. This is a Dharma Hall discourse called Mind is Walls, 
Buddha is mud. And of course, again, Dogen didn't give it that title. That's Shohaku Okumura and Dan Layton gave it that title. We should know that Zazen is the decorous activity of practice after realization. Realization is simply just sitting Zazen. At this monastery, we have the first monk's hall. So in this country of Japan, this is the first we have heard of this. This is the first time we have seen it, the first time we have entered it, and the first time of sitting in a monk's hall. This is fortunate for people studying the Buddha way. Later, a monk asked Dame, now he's referring back to something he referred to earlier that I didn't talk to you about. What principle did you attain when you saw great teacher Mazu and came to reside on this mountain? Dame said, Mazu told me that this mind itself is Buddha. The monk said, these days Mazu's Buddha Dharma is different. Dame said, how is it different? The monk said, these days, he says, neither mind nor Buddha. Dame said, this old man confuses people endlessly. I will let him have neither mind nor Buddha. For me, it's just this mind itself is Buddha. The monk returned and reported to Mazu, and Mazu said, the plum has ripened. Here's another discourse. This is called Not Understanding Mind Only by the authors of this book. Here's a story. Zhang Shu asked Lao Han, his student, the triple world is mind only. How do you understand this? Lao Han pointed to a chair and asked Zhang Sha, Zhuan Sha, I'm not sure how to pronounce these Chinese names. Teacher, what do you call that? Zhuan Sha said, chair. Lao Han said, teacher, you do not understand the triple world is mind only. Zhuan Sha pointed to the chair and asked Lao Han, I call this bamboo and wood. What do you call it? Lao Han said, Gui Shen also calls this bamboo and wood, and these people all have multiple names, so Gui Shen is just himself, so he's saying, I also call this bamboo and wood. Zhuan Sha said, if you search the entire earth for one person who understands the Buddha Dharma, nobody can be found. And Dogen comments on this by saying, these ancient worthies spoke like this, but today what shall I say? A chair and bamboo, bamboo and a chair, are not the same and not different. Whichever you call it, within this there is no triple world. Within the triple world there is no such thing as this. Having reached this situation, again, how is it? After a pause, Dogen said, Even though the boundless triple world is mind only, searching for someone who understands Buddha Dharma, finally we cannot find even one. Even though the bright, clear mind only is the triple world, searching for someone who does not understand the Buddha Dharma, we cannot find even half a person. That's all kind of weird and crazy, I imagine. But what he's saying here is that the mere understanding that of mind only, of all things being the mind, basically panpsychism, is still not the Buddha Dharma. That's not the Buddha Dharma. That's kind of a foundation of the Buddha Dharma. That's a kind of philosophical conceit it takes about what is the nature of the world and what is the nature of reality, but that isn't Buddha Dharma. So what is Buddha Dharma? Again, let's quote from Deepest Practice, Deepest Wisdom. And in this book, it contains a commentary by Kosho Uchiyama on an essay by Dogen called Shoaku Makusa, which they translate as refraining from evil, which I think is a pretty good translation. I, on the other hand, wrote a book in which I also commented on Shoaku Makusa, and I called that essay, Shoaku Makusa, Don't Be a Jerk. And the book I wrote is called Don't Be a Jerk. So there, go out and buy it. Give me some money. But um, this is a more sort of standard translation that I'd like to give you here. Agata, which is a poem of the ancient Buddhas, says, Refraining from committing various evils, carrying out all sorts of good actions, personally clarifying this mind, this is the essential teaching of all the Buddhas. So basically, Dogen is saying here, by quoting this old poem, that the essential teaching of the Buddhas, the whole Buddha Dharma, the most essential thing is don't be a jerk. That means don't be a jerk, don't commit evil, doing ethical activity is much more important than understanding a philosophy like panpsychism. Often when things like the sort of panpsychism-ish teachings of the Buddha are spoken about in Dogen's writings. It gets very poetic. And what the people who are doing the panpsychism thing, they're trying to kind of understand the world in terms of nuts and bolts, rationality, something that might be perhaps mathematically 
expressible, expressible in terms of mathematics. The Buddhists aren't trying to do this. They're trying to, to express something in terms of poetry. And a lot of times there's a feeling in this very materialistic society we live in that poetry is not as good as mathematics. Well, if you want to build a spaceship that can fly to Mars and put people on Mars and, and build a colony in space or cure Parkinson's disease or something like that, well, then math and science are better than poetry. But Buddhism isn't concerned with that aspect of things. It's leaving that aspect of things to other people to work out. What it's trying to do is find a way to live life and have the right experience of this life and make sense out of it. And so a kind of panpsychist idea of the nature of the universe is a foundation of that, which means you don't need God, you don't need a soul, you don't need an afterlife, you don't need to worry about those things. But it also emphasizes ideas like cause and effect, aka karma, which everybody hates to talk about and gets mad about, so I'm going to leave that aside. And the necessity for ethical behavior. So those are the real teachings of Buddhism, and if panpsychism is related to Buddhism, it's in terms of its philosophical foundations about the nature of reality, which are somewhat similar. But it's not related to panpsychism in that Buddhism goes into a much more different area of trying to say, well, okay, panpsychism, something like panpsychism is true, but what do we do about that? The other difference is that panpsychism is still based in a materialistic view of things. You know, it's still trying to understand the fundamental nature of reality in terms of matter. Uh, Buddhism doesn't do this. Buddhism rejects both a materialistic ideology, ideology and rejects idealism too. And idealism, uh, since sometimes dictionaries define idealism as a synonym for optimism, I always try to make the point that I'm talking about philosophical idealism, which says that that ideas that that's the main foundation of reality and even when you get into yogachara philosophy i would argue that yogachara philosophy although it resembles idealism if you try to map it onto western philosophy it also is not idealism it's also again not materialism either so it gets very confusing if you're trying to see it from either one direction or the other so that's a little talk about panpsychism went on a little bit too long. If you want to support me talking about panpsychism, you can donate via PayPal and Patreon. The links are below. That is how I make my living. That's how I continue doing this stuff that I do. And I really thank you uh, once again, as always, for your kind support. We'll see you next time with another fine philosophical talk. See you later. Bye.